Um, first of all, thank you everybody for joining my talk. Um, I'm not sure maybe some of you might have come to my other talk this morning. It was a joint talk uh, with the rising wave uh, processor. So if you are there, there may be a little bit of overlap in terms of just giving the introductory you know, um, portion to the chat GPT side. So again, thank you very much. And my name is Mary Grigleski. I'm a senior developer advocate at DataStax, like the primary sponsor of this conference. So, so my talk too is really about entering the brave new world of Gen AI with vector search. And actually, may I ask you how many of you are already working with generative AI um, or any forms of that? Okay, great. Are you, um, are you also like Cassandra user too, by any chance? Yeah, you are, okay. So you're familiar, are you by any chance using our Astra database? No, no, not yet, okay. So it's just, this would be more introductory. So bear with me too, I also will be talking a bit more introductory things just to set the stage. So like basically about AI. But so it, does this mean the rest of you are new then to AI, maybe like generative AI? Okay, so this probably is the right thing then. I will be kind of more introductory, so okay. And again, you know, I know you're all experienced people, but it's just, you know, from a perspective of knowing about Gen AI, that's what I'm trying to talk about. So this is the agenda. I'll just give a quick introduction and then a brief background of AI, Gen AI. What are the players in the new Gen AI era that we're living in? And then I'll introduce to you some terminologies like GPTs, NLP, LLMs, and then getting into vector data, database vector search, and then vector embeddings, all these things. And a small quick demo, given the fact that it's only a 30 minute, very short talk, but just to show you how you can leverage on using Astra, our managed uh, Cassandra in the cloud, right? Astra, DataStax Astra platform, you get the $25 every month free tier access. And the nice thing is that you don't need to give your credit card. So I think it's kind of a nice thing. You can just play around with it. And if you need more, you can always talk to any of us at DataStax too. So, okay, so that's kind of agenda for today. And first of all, um, who is Mary? Who am I, right? So I'm a senior developer advocate at DataStax. I think I assume most people know who DataStax is by now. And so, okay, so I'm actually, I came more from a Java background. I was a Java engineer for a number of years. And then um, about five years ago, I started doing advocacy. So this is about going out and speaking at conferences and um, hosting like community meetups and things like that. And I also am uh, the president of the Chicago Java Users Group too. And, but the thing is, it's a very worldwide organization. In fact, there's also San Francisco, Silicon Valley, East Bay, a lot of Java Users Group. So we're kind of a big family too, uh, and Java folks. And how many of you just out of curiosity are, are Java developers here by any chance? Yeah, so quite a few. Okay, very cool. So yeah, anyway, so that's about me. And, um, but the thing is now we're moving into this gen AI era. So kind of working with new things and we should all embrace it because interestingly, when I go to conferences speaking with some of the kind of deeply experienced Java folks and they kind of like, oh, this AI gen AI is just a fad. But I think not really so. They, they feel like it could be like blockchain, but it's a really different purpose here that we're trying to you know, leverage on. I think it's got a wider kind of application area. I think it's exciting is what I feel. So, okay, so I will be also sharing my con contact information later too. So no need to worry about this and I'll be sharing this slide deck as well. Okay, so a brief background of AI, right? So uh, even for me, I kind of have to say, because when I first joined DataStax, that was last year, um, March of 2022, that was way before the Gen AI time. And I actually joined the event streaming or the streaming team at uh, DataStax. We also have Astra platform. There's also a managed streaming, which is powered by Apache Pulsar. So that's the team I joined. Um, but as such too, I have experience and also like interest in a lot of different things. So about maybe like five months ago in July, that's when DataStax said, let's everybody work on Gen AI. So I took the opportunity, embrace it, and started learning. So, <clears throat> so a bit of a background, right? I feel that there's could be a lot of confusion too because there's so much stuff being talked about Gen AI since the birth of ChatGPT in a year ago on November 30th. And um, so it's kind of confusing. People are saying that, oh, they're going to take our job away because it's true, it can write code on, on our behalf. But the thing is, I think we're trusting it too much to, to think that it is going to take away our jobs. No, you know, then, and we know that it is just a machine. And so it still rely on human beings essentially. But anyway, so to kind of go back to AI, 
when I did started doing some research trying to understand this field, it's really, if you kind of look, right, the, the very first kind of documented, you can say, is artificial intelligence, meaning we're doing things, we are not doing things, we are relying on some machine or some other mechanism to do the work for us. It's basically, you can tr go back to 400 and 500 BC, and it's by this um, Greek philosopher called Archytas, and he in invented the steam-powered pigeons. And so that's kind of like, you know, mechanical, but still it's kind of a form of artificial intelligence, I suppose, because you are letting machine to do the work. So in a bit of a get, kind of fast forward to now, like 20th century, um, this kind of would be a most interesting kind of time in terms of, you know, how it has led up to the current stage of generative AI kind of phase of this, you know, of, of this whole computing world. Because it was like about 1930s, there was all these science fiction that came out, and then there's also Alan Turing, uh, the father of modern computing from the UK. He talked about can machines talk and or think, right? Can machines think and all these things is really getting everybody interested to get into research area, to really make machines operate beyond just like us telling it to do things. We want it to be really truly intelligent to do more than it, you know, it, it is kind of obviously can do, so to speak. So lots of experiment being done and all of these research and basically wanting to point out too, because I actually was also a developer advocate at uh, IBM before. And of course, IBM had the deep blue um, uh, kind of chess machine, essentially, right? So it, it, um, it essentially beat the, the chess um, what you call like, the chess champion of the, of the time, Gary Kasparov in chess too. That's actually kind, kind of an interesting story if you wanted to look into that, but by no means it is doing artificial intelligence the same way as it is now with generative AI. But then think of it that way, is that it is a milestone in, you know, in the move of kind of moving towards more and more sophistication, so to speak. So, okay, so this is just a quick, quick touch on this AI, kind of what led to it. Again, you know, it's all about automation that we are talking about. And also too, wanting to point out the, you know, kind of a general kind of, if we describe, you know, this whole kind of period in time, how does it fit, right? So this is like a, a popular kind of um, set theory, using the set theory to describe AI, artificial intelligence. So essentially you look into it, kind of peeling of the onions and uh, artificial intelligence is the big onion. And basically it's about mimicking the intelligence and behavior of human beings uh, or other living entities. We want this, that's what we want it to do. But when you kind of dig deeper into it, then there's a machine learning layer in which now we're actually not going to be actively training the computer to think, but rather we are providing it data so then it can learn from the data. That's machine learning. But the thing is too, just with that, it's not sufficient. So you have to kind of go even deeper, which is like to see how the brain works, getting into neural networks. That's what, that's what like the, really the core of this is, is the deep learning side, the neural network side. And that's what also where all the current like LLMs and generative AIs, all of these NLP, all of these are kind of getting into that neural network kind of layers, how the brain, the neurons work. Okay, so let's kind of take a look at this fascinating gen AI era. So what is generative AI, right? So it's a disruptive field in AI. Disruptive in the sense is that right now then, you know, any kind of computer program, we know there's input. We need some input to tell it what needs to be done. But the generative AI is that the difference is that we just have it kind of talk, you know, we, we can talk to the bot, talk to the machine as though it is another human being. So that's kind of disruptive in that sense and nowhere before there would there be any kind of machine that can interpret how we talk like humans. But because like, think about it, right? We are all engineers. When we first start to learn to program, it's, we have to follow strict rules. How do we give the input? Like say, for example, you're even like doing Java, let's say we have to give specific parameters. You have to tell it what kind of parameters and it's just kind of not very convenient, right? It's not really not how human beings talk. We, we don't talk to you like, hey, can you, you know, I want this equals two, that equals five, something. So basically it's amazing now generative AI can actually take human forms of 
kind of languages to kind of interpret the input. So that's what the, those are the prompts, right? The prompts comes in and being able to take from the prompts and then get the answers that we want kind of is a very disruptive, very innovative way of doing things. And generative AI makes use of the machine learning. If you look at the onion layer, it's the machine learning to learn from the data as well as the deep learning side of things, right? To, in order to be able to produce contents. And also to generative AI tends to be more creative because if you think of it, right, it can write poems and can write essays and um, generate code and look for images and design a new house and design your dress. All of these things is very innovative too, as opposed to the predictive AI in which like we're, we may be, you know, we're already doing some form of, well, kind of like we're already doing predictive AI before this, but that's still kind of the traditional way of making business forecasts based on some data or looking at weather forecasts based on some pattern in the, in the atmosphere or something, which is different because it makes prediction, but that predictive or predicted results will go away. After five days of prediction, it will be gone, that type of stuff. But generative, it tends to be creative and it lasts longer too. Okay, so now just a, a bit of um, history. Let me kind of make sure I, my time, sorry. Drop my <laughs> cell phone, so. Okay, so, and so now let's look into the, you know, the, uh, I'm sorry, this thing pop up. Okay, so this is just kind of a quick step through history. And then since the new millennium, 2000, is basically, that's when the neural network, all of the research started kind of, uh, kind of more like gearing it towards where we are today. Back then, they may not know exactly what it is, but what they are doing too is interesting to look at, you know, highlights of it during this period. Like only 20 years ago, there was the first, the first feed forward neural network language models. And then 2011 basically was Siri that came out with the iPhone that was kind of also quite, um, innovative too, because it's using NLP, natural language processing assistance, right? Apple did that. And then 2013 was when there was word to vec and that's really kind of really look, leading to where we are today, dealing with neural network, learning word associations from, from a large set of text, right? That was the word to vec And then 2017 is basically, if you uh, have been paying attention to, there's this paper called Attention is all you need. So that was a research being done by Google, group of Google researchers on the transformer too. Okay, so those are kind of a bit of a history that comes before it. And also then now let's take a look too. How about, you know, the players, right? To, so to speak in this new generative AI era. So if we kind of look into generative AI there, it basically is based on all the models. That, that's where the models are being trained and can become intelligent and perform all of the cognitive type of processing it needs. So as we all know, these are just a small handful of all of the models that, that have been developed, but essentially OpenAI came out, you know, and, and they have GPT 3.5, which shocked the world, I, I suppose, or kind of bring the world into a new age, you know, of computing. So GPT 3.5 came out a year ago, and then there are also other like Stable Diffusion, Dolly, Midjourney, these are with images, and, and then GPT-4 came out in May. There's also Codex, which is uh, basically the model that's behind GitHub, like Copilot, and Whisper, which is dealing with audio, for example. And then there are also generative, generative apps that are making use of those models. So these are just, again, a small handful, right? There's Monkey Learn, it's basically learning from the text, um, kind of like it looks for searches for answers in there. You don't need to really code too much, in fact. And then there's ChatGPT. And then, co uh, as I mentioned, GitHub Copilot and the other like Salesforce AI, Bing AI, Notion AI, all of these things that have come out. WordTune, for example. These are just examples of the apps kind of that makes use of the model. And one thing I want to also point out is that, <clears throat> as we all know, we are probably thinking more about text input that comes in and then from text, you can kind of search for what you look for. That's kind of like the same mode, so to speak. But the thing is to make it more useful for this generative AI era is that the thing is that the things should come out so then you can ask question in, in text and then it comes out with, back with images, for example. So it's sort of like you, you have different in, kinds of inputs and come out with some other response in, as images, as videos, 
you know, audio, all of these things are pretty advanced too. So think of this modality thing is also being kind of, uh, being done a lot of, or a lot of research is being done too. And these are kind of like the six main type of mod modes that we're trying to work with. So they kind of have cross functional kind of capability of finding each other, right? Based on one mode, you look for results on the other mode. Okay, so that's that. And also too, then let's look at players in terms of players, like what are people players, right? Just, so I just wanted to point out too, there are data scientists and computer, let's say computer vision engineers, they are more concerned with the what, right? Kind of subject matter. Like basically now a generative AI and they may not actually be as concerned with how things are being implemented. So who will be implementing things are the data engineer, AI engineer, ML ops, uh, DevOps engineer, kind of. So we kind of should be working together, um, kind of, you know, kind of helping each other out, so to speak. So yeah, so that's kind of like we have to understand the different roles that different people should play too. Okay, so now uh, let's kind of get back a bit then into some of the terminologies, right? GPT, generative pre-trained transformer, such as chat GPT. So GPT, essentially, what it does is, you know, as the name suggests, is transformer. So it's basically takes simple prompts, as I mentioned earlier, too. It takes natural human languages as input. And then what it does, too, is that let's say if you are text, you're searching for some responses that are in text, then you go and do similarity searches, for example. So say, for example, here at DataStacks, we have um, the, the uh, we have Astra, which is based on Cassandra. Um, you know, database. And then so we actually have capability of, in, you know, basically adding in vector data type that can help with similarity searches. And I'll be explaining with it in a little bit. So those are, these are like GPT. That's, that's what it is, right? It transforms and then kind of essentially answers the questions based on the prompts, the input, the questions that you are asking. And it produces content such as like a new essay, a blog post, writing a piece of music, designing a new dress and that type of stuff. So it's pretty nice too, this kind of technology. And the thing is too, with GPT, this actually came out at around like 2018 or so. Basically it was Alec Redford's paper only five years ago came out and wrote about GPT of a language model and then OpenAI first published it too then in five years ago. And then very soon, a year later, it was GPT-2 that came out with another language model. It's essentially trained on a data set with more documents too, as it's kind of expanded is, is uh, scope of it too. But then as we know too, then a, a lot of things have happened, right, within the five years. And then in 2022, just last year was stability, AI develops like stability, uh, stable diffusion, which is a deep learning text to image model that generates images based on text descriptions. So this led to like Dolly and Midjourney, that type. And then um, very soon too, then a year, exactly a year ago, November 30th, uh, ChatGPT, you know, releases GPT 3.5, so the, the, it, which is an AI tool that reached 1 million users within like five days. So it's clearly it's taken the world by storm. And then of course now, you know, the ChatGPT, all of these things continue to go on. And 2023, as we can see, all the big vendors, players started to come out, like, you know, Microsoft come out with Bing, building in the ChatGPT into Bing. Uh, Google has barred and all of these, as we can see, you know, um, we can see in the market now, everything Claude, there's also many things. And so um, then 2023, there's also a newer version um, of ChatGPT, all of these things. So without saying, we know that it kind of keeps going on this whole wave. So let's take a look then also into NLP, natural language processing. It is actually an inter interdisciplinary subfield of linguistics of computer science. So as we all know now, we need to process natural languages. So this is the discipline that we kind of use this, right? And it's basically uses rule-based kind of probabilistic machine learning kind of techniques to do kind of uh, processing data that, you know, kind of like that and it en enables computer to learn from the contents, including not just, you know, kind of producing, you know, A equals B or something, but it's basically create a context around what you're looking for. So it's kind of going beyond just the very obvious thing, so to speak. So the idea is that also it should be able to also generate like context and also um, draw some insights too from the documents that you're trying to to kind of ask. So that's what kind of where the magic comes from. And now then there's also large language models, LLMs, as we all know, LLMs are what we actually work with mostly these days, right, as engineers, developers. And this is a type of machine learning model. And it's also what is called like foundational model. So it needs to be pre-trained. So 
essentially to it pre-train and it also has to use a lot of computing resources because of the large amounts of data it needs to go through. And so it, it, you know, like us, right, like individuals, there's just no way we can train LLM, as we all know. It's always relying on big companies, vendors that are funding all of these uh, LLMs to be produced. And uh, so it takes a lot of, you know, uh, computing power, like GPUs, it's not just one or two, it's, we're talking about thousands of them to train. And even with that, it's gonna take a lot of time to do it too. So they are not cheap and everything. However, also bear in mind is that LLMs are pretty, kind of static too. Even though it has a large amount of data, it might be taking data from a year ago. So between a year and now, that set of data is missing too. So that's why there are also other techniques are being talked about, right? For example, a technique called uh, architectural pattern called uh, retrieval augmented generation. You might have heard in here too, RAG, right? That's a pattern that's commonly used too. It's just an architectural pattern. It can be implemented in many thousands of ways essentially, but that can help to fill in the gaps for these missing, so to speak, like missing data in the LLMs. So, so that's that. And then, um, so what does LLM do? It basically performs all of the NLP tasks. You know, it has to process natural languages that comes in all of the prompts and then answer all of the questions, analyze, all of the sentiments, all of these things, uh, chatbot conversations, for example. So now if I want to draw a picture of LLM where it sits, right? if you can kind of look back at the original onion diagram, it's sort of like artificial intelligence and then machine learning, deep learning is going inside and then very deep is where the gen AI thing comes in, the transformers, image gen, LLMs, the transformers sit in kind of inside this deep learning layer. Um, so yeah, so this is how it is. And then it also makes use of the NLP that's kind of behind it. It's really the, you know, the rule set that it goes by. Okay, so some examples too of a API and framework. So now we kind of go into like, well, how do we start doing something? It's basically, these are some of the common APIs and frameworks perhaps you have all heard about, right? By now, Langchain, Llama 2, Llama Index, and there are also uh, speakers from those companies too at our conference here. And then uh, Palm, Hugging Face. Hugging Face is interesting, it's an open source kind of AI hub thing. Think of it more like a GitHub, kind of for a repository for code, but this is AI hub, you know, for Hugging Face, you can search for things on there and use them for free too. Okay, so now let me then get into the vector database and vector search, and there's such a, so much to talk about this within 30 minutes, I have to go fast. So vector database, so why is it important, right? So let's understand it too, as such, right, it's a database, it's basically, purpose built to, it's built specifically to handle like complex machine learning purpose type of operations. And as such, you know, with machine learning, as we all know now, um, we need to do, be doing like searches. We can't just be like what we're used to doing data in a scalar version uh, or uh, kind of like manner. Scalar data is more like about single dimension. We need to now have data being able to be multi-dimensional. So what does it mean? It just means it operates like, you know, like you need to be able to handle data and kind of able to draw like conclusion to it and also build out a context. So as such too, vector database makes use of a lot of math underneath the hood. If you are kind of more keen on math, then you probably are aware of linear algebra and it's making use of matrix math, all of these things that goes behind the scenes vector kind of uh, all of these operations. That's why it's called a vector database. So it's built for that kind of machine learning type of purpose to search for data that's more complex because you want to be able to identify patterns or how they relate to each other, all of these things. And um, so the thing is too, in order to be able to use this vector database, what it does is that it will translate your input data, let's say, you know, from a string of, let's say, oops, sorry. It's just a, sorry, but like if you kind of look at a string, so you need to basically have to parse your data and then break down your words and each word will then be mapped to a numeric representation. Now, the thing is too, is that you break it down and so then you can also then look into how it's being stored. So it's called dimensions in your database. So you have, let's say you have a table, you have this vector data type. If you kind of do a selection, you'll be able to see that it is actually an array um, filled with, you know, um, what you call floating point numbers. So each floating point numbers represent each dimension of that string that you're trying to construct. So that's what uh, it is working with. So if you kind of try to do selection on database, it's not very interesting. It's just all numbers. They are all decimal places. And you're like, okay, you don't really know what it means. But the thing is though, that's what it is. Vector database has this capability of doing similarity searches and then using a technique called approximate nearest neighbor 
ANN to kind of help to do all of the searches. And it's all depending on you know, using vector math to help you to do it. So if you're familiar with vector math, there are cosine matching and uh, Euclidean or dot matrix kind of different ways of doing searches. So yeah, so if you're interested and you can always go back to learning all of your geometry, then they will kind of help you with that too. But actually, I was actually a, a math major, math major and computer science when I was in college many years ago. And I remember myself thinking, how would people use it, you know? So, and the interesting is you enter the workforce, as I'm sure you know, you're going in and come at some IT shop and you're fixing spaghetti code and then it's like, I never get to use math. And so now I finally, as an advocate, I'm working with vector search, vector database. I realize, oh, this is great. It's really digging up. And I actually go back to looking at some of my math and then say, oh, this is how it is being used. So pretty interesting too. So, okay, so that's vector database. Okay, so this, I, I kind of realized it's kind of, you know, kind of running short on time, but just want to kind of quickly um, kind of show it to you in diagrams, right? This vector database, spec vector data, essentially you can look at it like X, Y, kind of coordinate two dimensional. So that's how they are being represented. Like the V, um, you're kind of doing searches, right? They, are, they have a special place in the graph. Think of it like that. So then you want to see how close they are to what you're searching for. That's how it's being represented in a two dimensional graph like that. So, okay. And then another picture of showing it is that a bit more, makes more sense. Let's say you're searching for words like cat and dog and house, they are being like, you know, essentially represented like this in a conceptual space, you know, kind of you, you can look at it like that. So when you're doing searches too, it's trying to look for the closest to what you're searching for based on the, the vector embeddings that are kind of spread out in your, in your graphical kind of representation too. Okay, so that's that. And this one, I won't get into all the details, but one thing I want to point out is that there are vector databases, for example, at data, data stacks. We actually started implementing the vector data search, uh, data type two in our, our version of the Cassandra, which is the managed cloud. And now it will be in Cassandra 5.0. This feature will go into Cassandra. I think it's already out in beta too in Cassandra. So anyway, uh, one thing I wanted to also point out is that at DataStacks, we have our founder, co-founder of the company, Jonathan Ellis. He is the one that wrote um, JVector. This particular library is a pure Java library that actually does a lot of the, the, the um, uh, approximate nearest neighbor um, kind of technique in there that he implements. And it's using specifically this technique called disk and It comes, comes out of Microsoft too. It's really highly performance. So that's why you find our vector database to be very solid out there because of this mechanism underneath too. So if you are more interested in it, I can give you more information. And then if you need to, I can reach out and talk to Jonathan. He's really nice too. I can ask him if you need more information about that. So, okay, so that's that. And then uh, vector embeddings real quickly to say, what is it being used for, right? So besides doing like vector searches, you can actually use it for clustering recommendations like shopping, you know, you need product recommendations. Think of it like that. It can do searches in multidimensional fashion. Um, anomaly detection, diversity me measurement and classification of data, all of these, you can kind of use these techniques to do a lot of things too. Okay, so one word to kind of point out is that you can still use traditional database too. Nobody is stopping you, but you realize that it just cannot handle the complex data type that's required in doing machine learning kind of searches. So, so maybe it's just not a good idea, even though you can do it. Okay, so this is just a quick kind of diagram to kind of show you like in a typical Gen AI kind of rack based type of applications and how the vector data can be kind of, you know, in a graphical or in a diagram representing it, how, you know, the database is become very important. You do need certain kind of storage to kind of store the data. So that's where it, it is very important to have a data database that actually can handle the storage of the data very efficiently and allow it to be query also very efficiently. So the thing is with database uh, or data stacks, our, our database can handle the job very well. So, okay, so really quick demo. I don't know if I still have time, but let me really, really quickly kind of show you uh, like that. But we have, um, okay, uh, we have actually this one I will be sharing with you. The short link is basically you can go to our data stacks um, to, to sign up. As I mentioned too, you can sign up, you can use uh, sign up with GitHub or Google easily for single sign on or sign up without giving your credit card, which is really nice, just your email. And then you can create the account. But let's say I already have 
have this up here. Oh, let me quickly sign in. So I'll sign in, I already have an account. Um, it's as easy as you just quickly sign in and then you see this. And also too, there are different things. It's pretty self-guided. So I let you explore that. But I do want to point out that if you want to create a vector database, you can just go here, create a database, and then you can pick vector, and then essentially to give the database name a key space, which is names, essentially namespace, and then the region, right? AWS or Azure or GCP, I don't know why GCP, or oh, I something wrong with Google today, sorry. But some days, not all the time. So we have like the three major cloud platform. Then you can see quickly click, then you can create the database. And then from there, um, I already have one kind of spin up is actually using Azure. So you can kind of see everything in here, but again, I'm running out of time, so I won't have time to go step through everything. But you can also use CQL console to kind of quickly interact with the database or using CLI, your command line too. So, okay, so that's pretty much kind of it. And, but I want to point out to you, it, in my slide deck, I also give you the link as to how you can get to these examples. And so you can step through these examples, very much a self-guided example. So I'll let you kind of handle, uh, kind of experiment with it. So I'll get back into here and quickly kind of share with you again, this is the vector search on Astra platform. I invite you to sign up for our vector search. Again, you know, no obligation. Yeah, so you get something to use for free. Okay, and then some benefits. Oh, just wanted to say, as we have seen, you know, Gen AI is a good thing. You can ask and you, shall al you will always receive, but make sure you ask wisely because there are challenges too. There are hallucinations. Maybe if there are no data in there, it could give you back wrong answer. So you have to be very careful. Make sure, you know, there are also ethical concerns when you work with Gen AI and also the real time kind of lag too, as I kind of talk about it, but we can try to make up using rec pattern for LLMs, for example. Okay, so with that, I want to say thank you and share with you some resources. This is my slide deck, uh, the short bit.ly link and also the QR code if you want to um, connect to this slide deck and kind of get all the information from there. Okay, let's see. I see some of you are already taking a picture. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. And then here too, just some of the resources, the links. If you get my, the, my slide deck, you'll be able to get to all these links here. And then this one too, just want to quickly share with you, I have also a Twitch stream. If you want to follow me, and I promise in 2024, I'm going to restart doing more uh, streaming, live coding, live streaming, and I can invite you too if you want to join and interact with me, I'll put you on the video too, so yeah. And then with that, I want to, oh, these are just data stacks offering, but uh, you know, again, you can go up to our booth. Oh, booth is closed, I'm sorry. Okay, anyway, I give you that, those cards. Please sign up for it and we'll, we can talk. So with that, thank you very much and really appreciate you coming to my talk and please let me know what you think, thank you. Yeah. You're using our account in that case, yeah. But the thing is, you can also go through from, I think from the AWS side, you should also be able to pick, I think it's on the marketplace for our Azure database. I know very sure Azure can do it because I did a talk and then he was showing on the Azure portal. You can also do it from their side and then be able to also access from, from our console too. So yeah, 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 let's give it a try. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, yeah. <laughs>